today I'm uh, uh, happy to uh, be able to continue our dialogue with the bioengineering faculty here at UIC with uh, Professor Ermila Diwaka. Uh, Ermila has been uh, a faculty member here for, gosh, almost 15 years now. And uh, she and I uh, began uh, approximately at the same time. And we worked together to uh, you know, develop sort of a broader perspective on bioengineering. And uh, I'd, I'd like to talk with her today about uh, her career, her interactions with the department, and perhaps where she thinks the, uh, the field and the department should go in the future. So uh, welcome, Ermilla. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate your joining us. And uh, I, I think it would be uh, you know, prudent if you just tell us a little about yourself and your background and, and how you came to uh, uh, UIC. Okay. Uh, actually, my background is in chemical engineering. I worked with pharmaceutical uh, problems uh, in chemical engineering at the time. And I came from Carnegie Mellon University to University of Illinois. Uh, I was concentrating early uh, in bioengineering in research related to pharmaceutical industry as well as ecological sustainability because I do work in the area of uh, environmental uh, environment and sustainability. So that led me to bioengineering. And other thing is something personal in my life, uh, which made me think about more bioengineering problem. Uh, this is related to in vitro fertilization. Uh, in my life, I have undergone uh, in vitro fertilization mm -hmm. treatment for a long time, uh, for a number of cycles, both here and in India. And what I noticed is that the drug dosage, which is given in in vitro fertilization, uh, which requires everyday testing uh, for the woman and then changing the drug dosage, somewhat arbitrary because I noticed the, the, the drugs which are given to IVF patients are very expensive. So in India, they were giving me half the dosage which they were giving here, so that made me think that uh, there is no, uh, in a sense that th there, is, there is more can be done because part of the thing is uh, these drugs are expensive, so not many people can get the treatment. Secondly, the testing is uh, very taxing for both sides, mm -hmm. uh, economically as well as emotionally. Uh, if you give higher doses, then there is also a lot of side effects like uh, overstimulation which can be fatal sometimes oh gosh so mm. uh, i decided that maybe uh, coming from some of the chemical engineering background where i understand chemical reactions as well as uh, optimization background i can do some research in this area which can be helpful and essentially uh, we uh, uh, one of my PhD student in uh, bioengineering, Kirti, worked on this problem uh, with uh, one of the hospitals collaborating uh, from India because we needed patient data, which mm -hmm. was more mm -hmm. uh, available because in India it's like uh, assembly line uh, in the hospital because uh, infertility can also cause uh, uh, social stigma and that can cause women's life uh, to uh, they, they can make it miserable because of that. Hmm. So there are other things available, uh, other things sure. associated sure. with IVF treatment. So uh, what we try to do is uh, more or less uh, model based on some of the physics of the problem, how the drugs can interact and uh, in uh, uh, stimulating the uh, ovaries hmm. and uh, essentially can we do better outcome without testing and what we could show is that with the mathematical think uh, mathematical modeling as well as optimization we could reduce the doses significantly as well as testing can be restricted to only two days instead of all mm -hmm. uh, 10 uh, 12 days of cycle 
which can reduce costs further and reduce emotional taxation as well as this thing. And then this research is going to go in clinical trials uh, in December. Hmm. And so we are really excited about it because if we can show that it works, then people can use this method. So in some ways, bioengineering uh, is instrumental in getting me to this point as far as that research is so concerned. Your formal training was in chemical, chemical engineering yeah. and, yes. and bioenvironmental yes. perspectives. Yeah. And so your personal uh, Story led, Story led you into biomedical engineering. That, that, that's interesting. I often ask my students to write a, at the beginning of my medical imaging or bioinstrumentation classes a short uh, essay about their personal experience with medical imaging or medical instrumentation. And, and many of them have a similar story where they have uh, uh, maybe not formally trained in bioengineering until confronted with it as it affected someone in their family or in their life. Uh, I was a biophysics, or I was a physics major, and my direction toward biophysics came in a similar way. It wasn't a, a, a direct medical problem, but it was a, an occupational situation yeah. where I was working on a radar set and found myself exposed to high intensity microwaves. And I got to thinking, gosh, uh, they can use this stuff in a microwave oven and I'm standing up here next to something that has uh, megawatts of power and yeah. my head is right next to it. And so I started thinking to what extent I was a, uh, you know, a guinea pig. And yeah. so, and, and yeah, I, that, I, I have to do more uh, careful analysis of, 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 of what draws people that's to the true, field. Well, who helped you in, 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 in moving into the area? Did you have mentors or uh, advisors or was it all just your own search? Actually, uh, I was already doing, in bioengineering, I was already working in ecological sustainability so with some of my collaborators uh, in EPA. Mm -hmm. uh, have uh, inspired me because they had a big group of people where they were ecologists, economists, and lawyers, and things like okay. that. Uh, so I decided, I said, this, this is where the bioengineering can be of uh, help. So that was one of the persons in EPA who uh, got me involved in that. But in the case of in vitro fertilization, my own experience, and then I am married to a doctor. Okay. So I don't okay. talk to my husband. husband. <laughs> and in the department itself, I think you uh, um, yeah. uh, actually welcomed me in the department and I felt much more comfortable, especially doing interdisciplinary research uh, because uh, when I joined uh, UIC, there are not that many people who are doing interdisciplinary research. And uh, bioengineering, uh, moving to bioengineering, I was not sure at that time, but you convinced right. me that you can Right. Well, I know I came here in 1999 yeah. from Urbana, and the department was being reformulated at that time, and we were trying to redirect the efforts. And I think uh, uh, there were several faculty who joined the department from chemical engineering, and there were other faculty in electrical and mechanical who uh, then and still work in aspects of biomechanics, biofluids, yeah. uh, biomedical imaging. and so. Uh, I think in some senses it's a hyphenated discipline yes. <laughs> and, in that we have to have a physical or engineering foundation, but our perspective, for some of us at least, and maybe it's from personal experience, yeah. Yeah. moves away from the, the, the core uh, plant uh, control, monitoring, improving efficiency, or, yeah. or, or, or uh, even worrying about the environmental impact of yeah. Of, of, of those organizations to the sort of the, the the human end of the equation where we begin to see that there's a uh, uh, impact of these systems uh, leaking, melting down, falling down, uh, spewing out something that could have consequences. And then, and then as engineers, you're right, we think about how, you, how do you monitor those consequences. Uh, what other projects are you working on now? I think we are trying to extend now the in vitro fertilization work to some of the cancer treatment things where 
we were thinking that this in in vitro fertilization we can do customized drug delivery now right so can right. we do similar thing in cancer research because in some ways uh, in vitro fertilization we draw analogies between particulate process in chemi chemi chemistry to uh, some of the human body reactions and in some ways in cancer also similar thing happens that the tumors start increasing growing and things like that which is like a particulate process growing mm -hmm. so we are thinking that there may be similar do you work with colleagues in the College of Pharmacy or in the College of Medicine? I'm not yet. Uh, I haven't contacted them because I want to do some preliminary research in cancer and then mm -hmm. contact them. Uh, in in vitro fertilization, I had contacted, but in U.S., uh, getting people to give you patient data is much more ex much more uh, difficult compared to other countries like India, where I have contacts and mm -hmm. uh, it's not as this. If you develop contacts there, it's easier to get patient data. Sometimes. Yeah, we use uh, patient data from Shanghai yeah, in yeah, some of my yeah. research, and so it's uh, yeah. I don't. I worry sometimes that in our yeah. eagerness to be fair and safe, yeah. and to make sure all of this data is secure, that we might be some sense yeah. in some sense hindering yeah, the. The applications. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah, right about that. So those are some of the things I also continue to work in sustain ecological sustainability and all. This, this is through the Institute for Environmental mm -hmm. uh, Science. Actually, right now I am uh, not collaborating with them, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I have collaborators uh, all over uh, the world. Uh, EPA National Lab is one of mm -hmm. the collaborators. Mm -hmm. And I have collaborators in Austria, right. so we are working together. Now, at one time you had a, a research institute, right, yes. that you yeah. yes. had yes. organized. Is that still it's active? Still active. It's still active. I have something like 26 industrial participants. But what we do is not essentially ask the industry to give us problems. That's what we are doing. So, and there are national labs in the world also. So they, they are more collaborators than funders, kind of. Okay, but Some there there has to be money from somewhere. Um, Is this yeah. the so National right Science problem. Foundation? National uh, Science Foundation and the funding I have is also EPA and Department of Energy. Okay. So because uh, some of the work is related to that, so that's what I do. But uh, sometimes industry does give funding, but it's with a tag. And you cannot do long-term research in that. That's the thing. But they can define the problems which helps to get other funds. Right. And then you have graduate students in bioengineering, chemical engineering. Uh, yeah, industrial engineering. And industrial engineering. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so you're... Good. Good. So you see this work expanding and continuing? Yes. Uh, yes. I see it's, it's continuing. Good. Only my only worry is that uh, many times... Uh, because bioengineering is uh, just like you said that it's a multidisciplinary area that you I, I need students and postdocs who are mathematically uh, oriented very high mathematical right. this thing. so sometimes it takes more lot of training right this, this is a question I often get yeah. from students is yeah. should yeah. I first pursue a chemical engineering or electrical engineering yeah. degree? as a BS or MS foundation to graduate, postgraduate studies in an interdisciplinary field. And, uh, so many of my students are chemical engineers for doing bioengineering. Right. So it's, it's a hard question and I think it's hard to answer out of the context of what particular problems yes, you're working is, on. Yeah, you're right about that. Actually, that's, that's very much true. So that is uh, one of the... Although what we're seeing or what I'm observing in the department and in other areas is a, is a sustained growth in the department and the discipline of bioengineering and, yeah. and this growth is sort of predicated starting with the freshman year where the students recognize this connection you know maybe it wasn't as clear when you and I were uh, undergraduates or secondary school students but now this the uh, the undergrads immediately understand that they want to work at the interface and yes. that there's opportunities yes. to take engineering and apply it to medicine 
to try to anticipate or improve environmental or engineering problems and, and, and try to contribute. Uh, there's you know, still the industrial side of this. There are some big corporations that do this, but there's not uh, as many, let's say, as uh, are involved in the petrochemical industry or the pharmaceutical industry or uh, you know, the communication industry. And so it's, it's difficult, I think, for uh, uh, students who are looking for industrial careers uh, you know, to find the jobs. That is true. Yep. That is yep. part, part of the thing, I think, is because uh, if you look at bioengineering departments all over, uh, they're not, uh, mis uh, they don't have a specific format. Just like, uh, because other disciplines have been, ex they were existing for a long time, they have a specific format. So a chemical engineer from one school versus a chemical engineer from next school, you know what training they got. I but see. bioengineering, yep. that is not the case. Yeah. So some bioengineering departments grow out of mechanical, some yeah. grow out of electrical, some yeah. grow out of, uh, in the case of Rose Holman, they actually grow out of the biology department. Yeah. So that, that's, that makes it difficult for industry also to uh, see what, what the potential is. Because right, because right. And I think if you have an industrial problem you need solved, you want an expert yeah, you, you, you're not providing on-the-job training. That's no, not what no, it's called. No. It's called work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and they would like to have students that appreciate all the aspects, but they have to have some That's specific true. skills. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to that uh, uh, subject, I, I wondered, are, are you registered as a professional engineer? No. I am not registered as a professional. Okay, I know in civil and materials and chemical, that's yeah. often a, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. a... I think they have to give uh, some exam or something. I don't know actually the details of it. Okay. But I don't see uh, an advantage of that for my career. I know for people who are going in industry has advantage. Right. But since I'm not going in industry, I don't see any advantage. So I didn't do it. Yeah, yeah I, I'm not a registered professional engineer. Uh, it's my understanding that some states, Texas and Missouri, actually require oh. their faculty. Oh, I, yeah, you know, and as a discipline, you know, if you want to call yourself a bioengineer, you're welcome to join. Yeah. Uh, there's no uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, union card that you have to fill out yet to do that. But it's unfortunate that bioengineering doesn't have formally that path. There is no exam that allows you as a biomedical or bioengineer to register. You have to register under the umbrella of mechanical, electrical, or some other discipline. That's true. That's true. And, uh, well, I have a fellow, I'm an IMB. MB oh, yeah. Fellow, so yeah, I mean, we're, we're I've been a member of the IEEE for, gosh, over 40 years, yeah, yeah. and also am a fellow, and that's, that's sort of the pinnacle of the academic career. That's but that doesn't hold any water in a court of law. It doesn't impress a no. state regulatory no. commission. No. Uh, no. And, and uh, you know, to the extent that we are now all held legally accountable for everything that we do, it's, uh, you, you know, perhaps something to look into. And yeah. I, I think, yeah. I mean, doctors, they have a, they have a license, they have That's an exam true. schedule. Uh, yeah. okay. they, I, have, I, they have some responsibilities. Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know, I'm trying to, think ahead as to where the discipline might go and I I worry sometimes that we uh, we as researchers point always to the horizon of the new technologies the new uh, applications of, of, of knowledge and that might have a commercial or a scientific basis but but this often leads the uh, maybe the lower hanging fruit of, of innovation out of the picture. The, I'm thinking of this EpiPen controversy today where no. they have a, they have a, I mean, from, from our perspective, a, you know, an automatic syringe that administers an appropriate quantity of a, of a, uh, in, in, you know, a, 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 a chemical that is essential for students with, I mean, not students, for patients who have, you know, asthma or diabetes. I mean, these things you need to be able to get in fast. And I mean, they're charging $600 for these things now. And, and the price has gone up, you know, astronomically in the last 10 years, maybe three or 400%. Yes. 
and, yeah. and, and, and so as an engineer, it, it seems like there ought to be a better way to do this. As a chemical engineer, mm -hmm. as, as someone who does drug targeting, there ought to be a better way to do this. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. No, you're right about that. You know, the commercial aspects are... Uh, as the, the thing is that, uh, yeah, you have to think about commercial aspect of your research also. So, you know, so I haven't reached that stage yet. Yes, I have... <laughs> I have a well, I'm reaching the stage of retirement and I haven't thought no, of it, no, so I it's not going to happen. <laughs> for pharmaceutical industry, but... Uh, yeah. It hasn't taken up these three users uh, all over the world, but uh, that may take up. But my aim is that somebody should use it rather than making profit on it. That's right, it. right. Well, I think some of the foundations are now pushing in that direction, yeah, yeah. The, and and some of the grants that NIH and NSF give are are pushing in that direction yeah. because. Um, if they leave us alone, we just keep pushing forward. We don't necessarily yeah. ensure that the That's things right. are. Uh, are every, I was at a, a meeting last week, and they in uh, in the Society of Magnetic Resonance, and they talked about the difference between validation and certification, and they emphasized how many researchers are interested in validating their hypothesis and writing a paper about how something works. Uh, translating that into something that can be used as a certifiable diagnostic or therapeutic tool, uh, we leave that to the FDA. We leave that to, uh, you know, some other industrial enterprise. And, and they were saying that that's a mistake, that, that if you uh, uh, pass something off that isn't completely understood in the, in the field of drug targeting, for example, yeah, yeah. Uh, if it's not well characterized, it can't be safely and effectively uh, yeah. uh, implemented, and, and, and then you need all the trials and validations to do it. And sometimes it's hard to write grants to do that. Sometimes we're not as curious about solving yes. those problems. Uh, have you, other than your institute, have you formed any companies from patents of your own work? Uh, this is the one of the pharmaceutical software, actually, uh, which I have uh, for the separation processes in pharmaceutical industry. Okay. And uh, it has, uh, actually, the software is uh, not because it's mine, it's uh, state of the art. It's just that you need a business person to take care of the other side. And uh, and you married a doctor, you didn't marry an MBA. MBA. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, this is why we need an extended yeah, I family. Know, I know. <laughs> but I think right now, uh, one of the Indian companies is trying to get it and do all the things needed for business side for Southeast Asia. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, so they, they are trying to do it. I don't know what's... Uh, I just want people to use it. So I'm more interested in that. Yeah. So, well... As complicated as the field is, and or in applying things in the field, I think it's maybe important, since students often look at these videos, to to provide some advice about what kind of training, or education, or 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 interests bring a student into this. And and I think uh, one of the things I would emphasize, and this is again, especially for bioengineering, this thing that they should have more mathematical courses. It will really help the field quite a lot because what happens is that uh, uh, they can then collaborate with medical side and other things, but uh, if they don't know mathematics, they cannot do engineering. That's very important. Yeah, mathematics and engineering yeah, and exactly. science go together. Yeah, yeah. The, the trouble with bioengineering is it also extends to chemistry and biology and pathology yeah. and medical science and then and then In we're between. under this constraint of graduating or or planning yeah. to graduate students in four years I, I, and I, uh, I mean th no, they have to be yeah. because this is consider it as a multidisciplinary field where you have to put in at least two disciplines to okay <laughs> and then so likewise with computer science yeah. these yeah. are things yeah. that yeah. I mean, that yeah. need to be yeah. implemented, yeah. emphasized. Yeah. 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 yeah, So it is, it's not sufficient to just have one kind of uh, expertise in one discipline. You have to have at least two disciplines to work on a problem. You know? Right, and, and I've experienced the same thing, that, that the bioengineer is often the, 
at the hub of a network of experts. Yeah. And there may be the person who communicates with the physician, with, yeah. the, with the pharmaceutical company, yeah. Yeah. with the uh, instrumentation manufacturer, and with the students or researchers collecting data. Yeah. And, and, and the individuals are working through the bioengineer to develop That's something. True. Well, this has been very enjoyable. I, I think as professors, we're trained to speak for 50 or 75 minutes <laughs> and then wrap things up at the end. And so here, uh, I, I, are, are there any so, sort of final observations or perspectives that you'd like to share with uh, viewers of this series? Yeah, I think one of the things uh, with my experiences as a woman in engineering uh, I really uh, feel passionate about getting more women and minority students uh, in, the, in the graduate school, especially in engineering. Bioengineering is better than many engineering, but it's still not there, you know. So that is uh, one of the things. The other thing I was also commenting uh, and uh, uh, seeking advice here is about jobs in bioengineering. And one of the things we covered is that compared to other disciplines, bioengineering is not uniform in uh, all the different schools there. So if somebody can standardize some courses for bioengineering, uh, maybe ABET or something, mm -hmm. that will help the student because faculty always uh, are more interested in their own research areas. So they would vote for those kinds of courses and I understand that. I have right, like that right, too. right. But for the students to have a grounded education where the companies can say, okay, I know bioengineering students have no, they have to, they must have done this, this, this courses which are useful for us. Right, right. That will really be helpful. Yeah, I think it's very confusing for entering yeah. students or high school students considering careers yeah. in bioengineering. I, I think on one hand, it is more gender balanced. Yeah. It has a uh, uh, a, 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 a lot of diversity in, in, in all ways, uh, from the topics to the faculty to the uh, you know to the to the way the groups are set up, but in fact, it isn't as standardized as electrical or chemical. If you go uh, to the catalogs and examine the programs at Purdue or or Michigan or UIC in chemical engineering, electrical engineering, they're pretty much the same topics. If you look at bioengineering, they're all different. As a matter of fact, in terms of standardization, at the ABET, the, accredit the National American Board of, uh, of Accreditation for Engineering and Technology, that, that board uh, admits that bioengineering could be bioengineering or it could be biomedical engineering. So they can't even agree on the name. Yes. And there are some, and there's a subdiscipline called biological engineering. And these are subtleties that, that I think make it hard for a, a person to clearly identify that as a career choice. Yeah, that's something that, that we need to work on, yes. but I think someone looking into the discipline uh, needs to be aware that if you read the course catalog at one school, or if you go to uh, a, uh, an open house or visit with the faculty that, that you're going to get a a, a different a different academic program than the ones you get elsewhere. Some programs uh, require the students to minor in, in uh, a, shall we call it, a core discipline. Uh, departments like ours are actually co-housed in the College of Medicine and the College of Engineering. Yes. And so it's very common for our students to be doing, doing projects with clinicians here in the hospital. Uh, some schools are not associated with, directly with hospitals, so it's it's a you know it, it it's definitely a half full, half empty kind of glass thing. Yeah. If if you find a program that meshes with your interests or desires, then it's a good fit. Uh, some students are pursuing uh, biomedical engineering as a career from day one. Others are using it as a perhaps a stepping stone to. Uh, uh, medical, dental, pharmaceutical mm -hmm. graduate programs. And so you have to think about that. That's right. And then others are, you know, interested in industrial applications and 
We have a co-op program. Many schools have these work-study programs mm -hmm. where you extend your uh, undergraduate time, but you're working in the industry at Abbott or Baxter or, mm -hmm. or, or General, um, uh, General Electric uh, Healthcare, mm -hmm. and you're able to get some feedback just by working and seeing what people do. Yeah. Did you do you? Did you work in industry for a while in, yes, during your I career? Did. I did. I did work, but that was just for a year or so. I did work uh, for a chemical right. a software company. Did you ever consider going into? I I thought that's not for me. I, okay. Because, uh, the way I looked at it, I realized that I like academics much more. Okay. How about medicine? Were you torn? Uh, no. I was. I had gotten admission in medical schools, but I still had that pain there, so I don't know. Because, uh, the main thing in biology, uh, especially medicine, you need memory, good memory, and I don't think I have one. So, uh, that's the thing. So that's why. I like uh, medical profession because they can do really, uh, because they can affect human life directly. Right, one on one. You know, so, but the thing is that I don't think. Uh, my strengths are in that field. My strengths are right, more in that right. field. Yeah, maybe that's a good place to close in that yeah. I think uh, students looking into a discipline of engineering or healthcare, it has to mesh with their strengths and that where their passion and yes. where uh, they see themselves making a contribution. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing your contributions thank and you. I look forward to you continuing to participate in the department and in the college. Thank you. You're welcome.